We are in a sermon series. I am actually conclu concluding it today. And the sermon series is entitled, How Faith Works. And before I give you my sermon title for today, uh, one of the things that I love to do is recap. It's been a minute since I've been in the pulpit. It's been about three weeks. So I just want to kind of recap what we already know as a church family. I'm going to go through this real quickly. And then we're going to jump and find our topic for today out of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. But let's start at the top. Here's what we know. We know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. We know that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Uh, we know that faith and patience is how we obtain the promises of God. We know that faith works through love. We also know that we all, once we're in Christ, have been given the measure of faith. And we know that the just shall live by faith. And most importantly, we know that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. We are to walk by things not seen and not by things that are seen. We are to trust God's word, which is invisible, and not trust certain circumstances and situations that may seem more visible. So uh, I want to now bring us to Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 3. And we're going to start right now. It says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witness to the life of faith. Let me stop real quick. Hebrews 12 is right after Hebrews 11, obviously. And the Bible is not necessarily written originally in chapters and in, in, in verses. It's, it flows all together. So Hebrews 12 is right after God is or right after the writer has talked about the hall of faith, the heroes of faith. So if you ever read all of chapter 11 in Hebrews, you read these amazing things that different people in the Bible did by faith. And then it brings us to this chapter. And I'm going to start over again. Verse 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witness to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance. Somebody say endurance. The race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne and then it says, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. My sermon title today is Faith to Endure. Somebody tell your neighbor, say, Faith to Endure. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that you are in this place. Have your way in this room. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive. I pray that you would help me preach this word with simplicity and clarity. Help me to articulate myself in such a way that everyone at the sound of my voice can receive this word on good grounds. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, so we're talking about today as we conclude the faith to endure. Now, we heard a few uh, sermons ago that I preached on faith and patience. And we know that patience is about waiting well, but endurance is about suffering well while you're waiting. I'm going to say that again. Patience is about waiting well, but being patient doesn't mean that there are hardship always. It could just be that you want something to happen now and it's not happening, so you have to employ patience. But endurance, by definition... It actually means to have fortitude. It means to persevere. It means to suffer. It means to patiently suffer. So patience is about waiting well, but endurance is about suffering well. In other words, staying submitted and obedient to God through the hardships. Because we all have different challenges and hardships in life. And there are moments where our discomfort can feel more uh, it, it, it can push us in a, in a mode to where we go back to default our, our, our vices for comfort. Let me say it better this way. Sometimes when we're in an uncomfortable situation, where we're in a discomforting season, if we are not surrendered and submitted to God, the discomfort can cause us to go back to our default settings of sin nature, our vices that we normally use to medicate the pain that we're feeling. 
That's why Jesus identifies himself as the great physician. Because you don't need to medicate your pain with vices such as porn, such as drugs, anger, whatever your vice may be. I'm not going to list them all because I might miss yours. But we are to see Jesus as the great physician to where whatever our, we're feeling physically, emotionally, mentally, or relationally, he is the healer of all of that. Amen? So suffering well is a season that every believer will have to go through at some point in time. Uh, you know, I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are, how beautiful you are, how ugly you are, how in shape you are, how not in shape you are. You can't be more of something to avoid suffering. You, we are all going to go through a season of suffering, but do you know how to suffer well so that way it is not a loss? You gain something in the process. I don't want to suffer and then also don't gain wisdom in the suffering. I don't want to be in a season where I'm discomforted and I don't learn that the comforter can help me in my discomfort. So in seasons of suffering, God uses that. It's not that he uh, brought it into our life, but he uses it to teach us, to train us, to prepare us and to mature us. Somebody say amen to that. And there is a direct correlation between suffering and authority. Many of us want to walk with a greater level of authority, but authority doesn't go, authority doesn't happen unless you've been through a season of suffering well. When I think about Jesus, and the Bible talks about that when he fasted and prayed for 40 days and night, and the enemy pressed him and put pressure on him, he had temptation. The Bible says that not only after he prayed and fast, but after he resisted temptation, he came back with power. You may got the praying and fasting part, but do you have the resisting of temptation part? Because you can pray and fast all you want, but if your praying and fasting is not leading you to submitting more to God, then your praying and fasting is in vain. My praying and fasting is so that I can be sensitive to his voice and know what he's telling me. So in the season of discomfort, in a season where I feel like I'm suffering, I'm fasting and praying to hear him so I can submit to him and I can get to the other side of my temptation. And when I get to the other side, I come out with power. I come out with authority. When I think about different people in the Bible, they went through seasons of suffering before they stepped into seasons of promotions and victory. I think about Moses. The Bible says that Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And we know that by him uh, choosing to not be in a very comfortable situation uh, in Pharaoh's uh, kingdom, he chose to suffer with God's people. And we see if we follow that story that Moses ended up having power and authority because he chose to suffer for a season so he can have power for the next season. You may be in a season right now where you feel like things are hard-pressed. You feel discomforted. You feel challenged. But my encouragement to you that is in this season, don't delay what God wants to do by keep going around the same mountain. In this season, if you're uncomfortable, if you're discomforted, if you're challenged, you need to be asking God, what can I learn from this? Not that he's given it to you. I want to make sure that uh, we're aware of that because the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God comes to give us life and, and life more abundantly. I also want to say this too. That when it comes to promotion and victory, it does have protocols. A lot of people don't know the promotion and victories that we want, it has protocols. And the protocol is that we may go through a suffering season. Now, I talked about seasoning a little bit earlier about the popcorn, and, and it just dropped in my spirit right now. Suffering season leads to a seasoning season. In other words, when, when I was in my 20s, there's different levels of promotion and authority that I didn't have access to till I went through some things and got 30 and 40. But it was in certain seasons in my 20s that I learned how to submit to God that I got more seasoning when it, by the time I got in my 30s. That's why we, call, we don't call people old here at Century. We call them seasoned saints. Because they're seasoned with life. They're seasoned with experience. They're seasoned with seeing things. And the Bible does say that we are salt and light. 
And we go through a suffering season because God is trying to give you seasoning for a new season. Because the season that God has for you, you can't be as bland as you are in this season. In this season, you may, not, you, you may know how to pray, but, but God might allow you to go through something so you also know how to forgive. You may, know, you may know how to forgive, but you may not know how to be friendly. You may know how to be friendly, but you may not know how to uh, uh, steward what God has given you. So God allows us to feel pressure that it's not necessarily he's bringing into our life, but it, the pressures of life that we feel, it is a product because we live in a falling and sinful world. So in seasons where we feel like we're suffering, I need you to shift the perspective and say if you're in a suffering season, no, I'm just in a seasoning season. Tell your neighbor, say, you're in a seasoning season. And Hebrews 12 tells us that we are uh, running a race that is set before us. We're running a race that is set before us. God called you into salvation. He called you into a relationship, and he is the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, he called you into this life, and he's going to walk with you through this life until the next life. But he is a gentleman, and even though he wants to walk with you, he will not force himself on you. God won't force you to do anything. He has made us all free moral agents where we get to choose what we want to believe, what we want to do. And this is why it is important that we keep a constant dose of God's word. One of the things that we already know in our recap is faith comes by hearing and hearing God's word, which means faith doesn't come from what I heard. It comes from what I keep hearing. I don't grow in my faith and I don't overcome seasons of challenges by hearing a word. I go through seasons of overcoming whatever I'm going through by staying in the process of continually hearing God's word. Amen. It's not about what you heard. It's about what you're hearing. Because what you heard got you to this moment. But what you're hearing is going to get you to the next moment. What you heard gave you a little bit of seasoning in this season. But what you're going to hear is going to give you more seasoning for the next season. Amen. So when it talks about we run a race, uh, one of the things that I learned, my, my son, uh, uh, DJ, he ran track in high school. And he had a really cool uh, track coach. And what was cool about this track coach is he would give every kid a nickname, but he, they had to earn it. So he would watch them for a couple of weeks, maybe sometimes even a month, to kind of see where their strengths are, and then he will give them a name. And I remember for the very first time, my son, he was like three months in, four months in, he was like, man, the coach ain't gave me a name. And then finally the coach was like, I got it. I got your name for you. And his name was D-Rough, meaning diamond in the rough. Because my son didn't start doing track till he was probably already in junior high, almost high school. So he was, he was a late bloomer, but he was really good. And one of the things that uh, we've learned in his process being a runner is that runners have to hydrate their bodies day before the race. That in long, whether it's a 200, uh, uh, whatever the different meters you can run, you are supposed, if you got a, a meter, if you have a race on Thursday, you're supposed to be hydrating your body Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Because if you're not hydrating, you can cramp in the middle of the race. And the race that was set before you for you to win, if you're not properly hydrate, you can cramp and disqualify yourself for the race. And then there's, there's uh, another thing that runners needed to do. They needed to stretch. Man, they spent like 30, 45 minutes on stretching. Because as you stretch, you allow your muscles to grow. You allow your muscles to develop. And you can take longer strides. You can, you can be more efficient in your running. So I believe as we use this as an analogy that, that uh, we are to run this race, I want us to kind of look at it as when we hydrate, that's the word of God is the main source to hydrate our spirit. And if we're not disciplined in hearing God's word every day, then there's going to be a moment where God sets something before us, but because we haven't been hydrating days before, because we haven't been reading the word days before, because we haven't had a consistent relationship or coming to church days before, God can give you an opportunity where you can step into victory, step into promotion, but you cramp up because you haven't been hydrating on the word of God. 
I believe we got a lot of Christians cramping in the process because you wanted the promise of God, but you didn't understand there's a process to get to the promise. You got to hydrate every day. That's why he says, I'm the living water. He hydrates our spirit. But if you pray the promise, but you are not spending time with the word that will feed your spirit to get to the promise, you will pray promise. And when God sends you the promise and an opportunity, but may show up as a problem, you'll start cramping up because you don't see things the way God sees things. You saw the problem as you were already defeated. God solves the problem as since you've been hydrating off of me, you didn't know that there's another gear you can kick in. You didn't know that there's a level of authority that you have. You didn't know that I put that problem not to show you how big the giant is, but to show you how big I am. And we got to stretch. God uses trials, hardship, discomfort, to stretch us so we can have the capacity to handle more. If I don't stretch as a runner, I can't develop in my muscles. If I don't stretch as a runner, I can't handle uh, uh, more victory. So when we stretch, uh, metaphorically speaking, when God uses the hardship, the challenges of life, it's so that he can give us more blessings, more challenges, and more responsibilities. Now, you didn't shout on that because, <laughs> because sometimes you want the blessing but without the burden. We want the blessing without the understanding that for every blessing that you're praying for, there is a responsibility connected to that. I remember believing God and praying that I can be a lead pastor one day when I was in my early 20s. If God would have put this on me, what I am in now, when I was 20, I would not have been able to handle it. My marriage would not have been able to handle it. My kids would not have been able to handle it. So God had to send me through a season of being seasoned so that in 10 years of getting seasoned, 10 years of being put in the crock pot to get all of that barbecue sauce, to get all of that marinade, to get all of that so when the time is right and for me to present myself, I taste good because I'm representing the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You don't taste good in this season because you're bland. You ain't got enough seasoning in your life. You ain't got enough things that you've conquered in your life. You know, different people, uh, I, I, one of my mentors and leaders, uh, they said something that I could have got offended by, but I remember going to one of my uh, leaders, and I asked him to mentor me, and I, I remember him saying, what does that mean to you? Because people ask for mentors, but they don't understand there's a responsibility on the mentee, that the mentor's job is not to call you every day to say, hey, how are you doing? Are you Okay. But a mentor's job is to push you, encourage you, to get you, a Christian mentor, to get you to God's will for your life. Which means that at times they're going to be unimpressed with your success. At times they're not tripping off all your accolades because the greatest hindrance to new success is old success. Sometimes we looked at what we've done in the past and we forget that there's new to happen in the future. That if I looked at what I've conquered in the past, I'll take my eyes off what I can conquer in the present. So I remember him telling me, he was like, son, do you know what you're asking me? And I was like, yeah, to be my mentor. Dang, what's going on? He said, I only mentor champions. And I was like, what you trying to say? I'm not a champion. <laughs> he said, look at the type of people that I mentor and lead and look what they're producing in their life. He said, I need you to go conquer something. I need, and, and with that, from my context, that means, why don't you take over the youth ministry and let God use you there? Why don't you take over a department and let God use you there? Why don't you take over something so you can show me that you can handle more responsibility? Because if you want me to mentor you, if you want me to help you be a champion, if you want me to help you be all that God's called you to be, I need you to be able to conquer something. I need you to be able to handle pressure. I need you to be able to handle temptation. I need you to be able able to handle if I don't call you back or if I don't do something you think I, I should do, you won't so easily leave or so easily get offended. It's really hard to be a disciple of anyone if you're easily offended. 
Because if you look at the life of Jesus, he was always throwing shade at the disciples. Little faith. How long do I need to be with you? In fact, sometimes I'm like, dang, Jesus, that was kind of harsh. You're the, you're, the, you're the son of God, and they're just human beings trying to learn. But Jesus would challenge them. Jesus perfected them, and Jesus used them mightily. And I believe that uh, God wants to use his spirit. He wants to use leaders and pastors and different people in our life to help build us up so we can conquer something. I believe every Christian's destiny is leadership. I don't believe that it, not one Christian in here should not be f- trying to conquer something for the Lord. That there should not be something, whether it's conquering, getting your marriage back, right? Whether it's working on your nonprofit that God told you to do. Whether it's working on a business. Whether it's addressing issues in the world. We should all be seeking the Lord to figure out, God, what on earth did you create me to do that I can only do that you want to do through me? Because there's something that only you can do that no one else in this room can do. And the only way that you're going to figure out what that is, is you got to allow the Lord to put you in a seasoning season. Where he can train you and teach you. Where he can show you. Look what this says right here. 1 Peter uh, chapter 4 verse 1 through 2. It says, so since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, for you arm yourself with the same thought and purpose check this out since christ suffered as well as christians you have to know that you're going to suffer i understand that i understand we don't like that part of being a disciple but if you read the fruits of the spirit patience kindness self-control there is one in there called long suffering (laughs) and thank god that god teaches us long suffering because he was long suffering towards you and i And and let me make this very practical. Not every suffering requires us to be martyrs where we got to die. In in, in this context, in in this country, that may not necessarily be the context for us. In other countries, it can be. But, But in its most practical way, suffering means resisting the flesh. That's what it means to suffer because your your flesh wants you to do something. That's contrary to God, and can you resist that? That brings a level of discomfort and suffering to us. So suffering is resisting the flesh. Somebody say amen to that. Arm yourself with the same thought, purpose, patiently to suffer rather than fail to please God. Which means if I'm not willing to suffer, it may be hard for me to please God. What does that mean? Because there's some seasons where I want to give in to my flesh. There's some seasons where I feel I, I, want, to, I want to act out maybe in the flesh. But God is saying to please me, you got to be willing to suffer to please me because pleasing me goes against your flesh. That's why God says the spirit and the flesh are contrary with one another. And you can't please God while you're in the flesh. What is the flesh? It is to be carnal in nature. It is to have a carnal mindset. The flesh is more about a mindset. You think selfishly. You think about yourself. All you want to do is gratify what feels good. And I've heard, I've heard, you've heard me say this. Not everything that feels good to you is good for you. And not everything that is good for a moment can help you have goodness for a lifetime. There are some things that will feel good in a moment, but it can hurt your future. And just because it's... It's good doesn't mean it's God. And God is trying to get his people off of discerning his will through the path of good. Because not everything that you're going to find God in is through the path of good. In fact, Adam and Eve were allured out of God's plan because it was a fruit that looked good. How do we determine between good and God good? It's through the word of God. There's man's good and then there's God's good. If you want God's good, you need his goods, which is the word of God. (laughs) So for whoever has suffered in the flesh, having the mind of Christ, check this out, is done with intentional sin, has stopped pleasing himself and the world and pleases God so that he no longer spends the rest of his natural life living by his human appetites and desires But he lives for what God wills. Now, let me say it this way. Circumstances, when we are in a season of suffering, circumstance is not to break us, but to bend us. You think 
the situation that you're in is to break you, but God is trying to bend you towards his will. When certain door closes, it's not that God is trying to break you. He's trying to show you, I have another door for you. When certain people leave your life, he's not asking you to pray and cry. And you, you can grieve, but he don't want you to beg anybody back who left you. With that, that, that's God bending you. Hey, this person is not for you. I got somebody else for you. So when we hit hardship, when we hit affliction, it's not that God wants to break us. He may be trying to bend us towards his will. Now, I will say this, if you don't bend towards his will, he will break you. And what I mean is, God says he loves a broken spirit and a contrite heart, but that's not his original plan. He rather you follow him out of obedience, but if obedience doesn't work, if God's been, let me say it this way, if God sent a prophetic person to tell you something about you, what the Lord says, and you knew it was God and you disobeyed that, then you've heard it in a sermon, and you heard, oh man, God told me again, and you still didn't follow that. And then maybe somebody called and said, I had a dream about this. And, and you see that God is trying to woo you into an act of obedience. But if none of that works, the psalmist said, it was good that I was afflicted unless I went astray. What does that mean? God will use hardship and affliction to get your attention. But he didn't instigate the hardship and affliction. He didn't bring the hardship and affliction. That hardship and affliction came because of your choices, came because of what you wanted. But God will use that to get our attention. I wonder if God is getting some of our attentions today. That these, the season that you may be in, is it a season because God is trying to bend you towards his will and you keep doing your will? Now, God uses, I'm going to say this, suffering, which is resisting the flesh, to perfect his nature in us so he can manifest his promises to us. I'm going to say that again. God uses suffering to protect his nature in us so he can manifest his promises to us. If you are a Christian, I, I said this and I'm going to say it again, we can't avoid suffering. It is something that's going to come to all of us. If you live in this world, there's going to be trials and tribulation. This is why Jesus says, I, be of good cheer because I overcame them. But what overcomes the trials and tribulations of life? Our faith in Christ. Amen? Let me give you why do we experience suffering. I want to give you four reasons why we experience suffering. Number one, because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world where sin is in the world. Christ came. So first man, Adam, disobeyed God, and sin came to all of humanity. The... Uh, the way some people describe commentaries or theologians describe Jesus, second man, Adam, obeyed, Jesus, or obeyed God and brought righteousness back into the world. So we live in a fallen world because sin came into this world, but God gave us a way out of sin's dominion by giving us Christ. And if we follow Christ, sin doesn't have authority over us because we have a greater grace accessible to us through Christ. That's why the Bible says where sin abound, grace abounds that much more. So a fallen world. Secondly, because of the choices we make. Not every suffering that you experience is the devil's fault. In fact, you're blaming the devil for a lot of things. In fact, you're actually giving the devil more power than he has. The, the, the most power Satan has over any of us is the power of suggestion. He can't make you do anything. All he can do is suggest, tempt, and deceive. That is the full extent of his power. So when you like, Satan made me do it, the devil made me. No, the devil and Satan didn't make you do anything. You just wanted to do it. Satan didn't make you fall into somebody's bed and have sex with them. Satan didn't make you smoke drugs. Satan didn't make you do none of that. You chose to do it. You wanted to do it. You wanted to feel good, and, and, and the moment of feeling good was greater than you trying to please God. If I don't tell you the truth, you won't be set free. My wife and I, we went to Bible college, and we have our master's in counseling. So we get a lot of people in uh, when we used to do counseling. We don't do it as much anymore because of our responsibilities. But they would say, yes, Satan made me do this, and the devil made me do that. And I'm like, man, you're making Satan super powerful. Because 
when we had the Bible in Christ, he is already defeated. In, what does that mean, in Christ? When I live in Christ, when I live in his word, when I walk in his word daily, I'm free from Satan. I'm free from his suggestions and temptations. And typically, Satan always brings temptation and suggestions if we look at how he did Jesus at our weakest moments. Some of our weakest moments are in seasons of transitions, breakups, job loss, uh, disappointment. That's when... Excuse me, he likes to bring suggestions. You sure God going to get you out of this? <laughs> you sure you're not going to be alone forever? You sure this person is not good? He, he starts suggesting things. But when he suggests things, you have to stay in a season of being like Jesus. That, that man doesn't eat off bread alone, but off of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus told Satan when Satan was trying to tempt him. If Jesus needed to use the word to defeat Satan, what do you think you need to do to defeat Satan? The Bible says that a servant is not greater than his master. If Jesus had to fast, pray, and resist sin, what do you think we need to do to resist sin? We have to fast, we have to pray, and we have to resist. A lot of people keep asking me, how is your church seeing some of the success that it is seeing? I said one of the first things that I did before I started was I called a prayer and fast. Our church went on a seven-day praying and fast corporate uh, a fast for everybody and if I brought up I don't have it right now the seven points that we fasted for we're seeing God showing up in all seven of those points so again Satan didn't make you do anything you did it because you wanted to I really need you to know that because if you can outsource oh my gosh I feel it on this one if you can outsource it to Satan, then you can remain a victim. If you can keep blaming Satan, you have an excuse to keep going back to your sin. If you can keep blaming Satan, you can stay a victim when it's time for you to be the victor. If you can keep blaming Satan, you won't forgive. If you can keep blaming Satan, you'll keep saying, I was born this way. If you can keep blaming Satan, you'll keep prescribing things to him that you don't know you have the authority to overcome. This is why we can't blame Satan for everything. Satan does steal, he does kill, and he does try to destroy, but what he can't do is make any of us do anything. Number three, why do we experience suffering? Because of the God we serve. We're going to experience suffering and pressure because of the God we serve. The Bible says right here in the passage that we just read in uh, 1 Peter, arm yourself with the same suffering as Christ. So meaning the moment you say, I want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life, I opened myself up to knowing that by serving God, it comes with pressure. And I really believe that if the church is going to see the glory of God, here it is right now, if the church is going to see the miracle signs and wonders and glory of God, they have to be okay with being persecuted for God. You can't get the glory without the persecution. You can't get the glory without the suffering. We want the glory, but we don't want the cup of suffering that it comes with. In other words, if we want to see greater manifestations, greater healings, greater deliverance, greater freedom, we have to be okay with people not okay with what we believe. We have to be okay with people thinking that we are something that we're not. And guess what? You don't need to fight your battles because if you're doing it in the name of the Lord and God's called you to do it, he's going to fight your battles for you. One of the confessions that we're going to have to make as believers I need us to make this confession. We, we're, we're coming up in a political season where it gets very divisive. And I need us to say, I don't have enemies. I don't have any enemies. I'm a lover of all people. I'm a lover of God and people. And the second thing we're going to have to do is, God, help me to see people the way you see them. Help me to not see what man see, but help me to see what you see. That's how you build what we're experiencing, a multi-ethnic, a multi-generational, a multi-faceted church from the street to Wall Street. This is how we're going to build this tabernacle for the Holy Spirit to dwell, where we're not building on our preferences, where we're not trying to pick and choose what we think 
things should look like, but we're surrendering to God, and we're seeing that God has made everyone in his image, not our image, and if we can believe that God made man in his image, we can start seeing them the way he sees them. Somebody say amen to that. I felt by myself on that one. It's all good. And let me get some pads, please. Uh, fourth thing, because of the, pers- the purpose and destiny we're called to. Why do we experience suffering? Because we live in a fallen world, because of some of the choices we make, because the God we serve, and because of the purpose and destiny that we are called to. God allows us to have seasons of suffering because it helps us bear lasting fruit. John 15, verse 16 says this, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have appointed you. I have planted you that you might go and bear fruit. This is the part that we need to lean in on. And keep bearing fruit, that your fruit may be lasting, that it may remain. God doesn't just want you to have fruit. He wants you to have lasting fruit. He doesn't want you to just have some promises. He wants you to have promises that go generationally. God wants us to have lasting fruit. And when we are people who have more passion for roots than fruits, then when seasons of hardship come, we're not so easily moved because we're rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. This is why everybody in here, you need to pray more for roots. God, give me a passion to be rooted more than the fruit that comes from being rooted. If you can have a passion for roots, if you can have a passion to be rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus, that you care more about depth than you do about distance, you'll get the distance. If you care more about what God says versus what he has, you'll get what he has. If you care more about being obedient to God than the outcomes of God, you'll have the outcomes of God. When you have depth, when you have roots, when you're grounded in Christ Jesus, you are planted by the rivers of water. And the Bible says that you will bear fruit in due season. Your season might not have came because you weren't rooted enough. Your season might not have came because you're not grounded enough. And God is saying, for what I have for you, you need more roots. You need, more, you need to be more grounded. You need to be here. Let me say this one. More consistent. More committed. You can never outcommit to God. I'm not saying to man, but when you commit your life, your heart, your sexuality, your finances, your marriage, your children. When you commit it to God, God can do more with you putting it in his hands than you trying to keep it in your hands. Let me say this, and I'm almost done. Roots are developed, here it is, in battles we embrace, not battles we avoid. Roots are developed in battles we embrace, not battles we avoid. I heard a man of God say this, that David stayed home in the Bible. The Bible says that David stayed home at a time kings were supposed to go to war. And because David stayed home and avoided a battle, he faced a battle he couldn't face. The time he stayed home when he was supposed to be battling, he actually got into an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. So when you, let me say it this way, when you avoid the battles that you're born for, you'll face battles that you're not equipped for. My gosh, when you avoid the battles that you are born for, you'll face battles you're not equipped for. David was born to face the battles on the battlefield, but because he stayed home at a time he was supposed to fight, He got attacked with a battle that he wasn't ready to deal with. I hear that for somebody. Your battle might be forgiveness. Your battle might be your anger. Your battle might be jealousy. Your battle might be uh, giving to the Lord. Whatever your battle is, it's time to embrace it. Because if you are going to be a Christian that has seasoning, if you're going to be the salt, salt preserve, salt protect, if you're going to be the salt in life of the earth, then you're going to have to embrace battles because let me say it this way some of the battles that you're facing is so that you can have wisdom to help other people some of the battles that you're dealing with is so that God can give you an answer on your lips that helps someone else who's going to go through the same thing that you just went through (laughs) 
James 5 says this. I have one more scripture after this. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with anything and went through everything and never once quit. All the time honoring God. What a gift life is to those who stay the course. You've heard, of course, of Job's staying power, and you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. That's because God cares, cares right down to the last details. I hear the Lord saying right now, stay the course. Stay the course. You got out of that unhealthy relationship, stay the course. Don't go back to that person. God, t God told you to develop some new habits, stay the course. Don't, don't lose that habit. You've been going to the gym because you know that you need to get your health right. Stay the course. You've been forgiving. You've been loving. Stay the course. Stay the course. If you stay the course, every time you say yes when you want to say no, every time you wake up when you want to stay in the bed, every time you forgive when you want to be unforgiving, every time you give when you don't want to give, every time you love when you want to hate, what's happening is your roots are going deeper and deeper and deeper so that you can come out of that situation with power, with authority, so that you can be a greater witness for Jesus Christ. And my guy says, Jesus Christ, where you at? Come on. That was the punchline. I'm praying today that Christians stop lacking the endurance to stay the course. You start well, but you finish weak. We start well, but we finish weak. We know how to get the job, but do we know how to keep the job? We know how to get married, but do we know how to stay married? We know how to start a goal, but do we know how to keep the goal? We know how to start things, but can we stay the course until the work is finished and God releases us? Because we should all share the same passion that when we get to our Heavenly Father, we want to hear these words where God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Faithfulness doesn't count when you can actually leave. When you, when, when faithfulness counts when you have the temptation to leave and you stay. That's what I'm trying to say. And I want to end on this one because this is important. I'm taking a little bit longer, and we're going to close real soon. But I think this is important because this passage of Scripture helps us identify where we're at when it comes to seeing God's promise manifest in our lives. This is about the parable of a sower. Jesus spoke in a parable. And he spoke in a parable, and he talked about four different type of soils. He talked about the hard. He talked about the stony, the thorny, and the good one and what they represent. And I'm going to read it. And Mark 4, after the disciples are trying to get understanding, what did that parable mean? They would often go to Jesus, what did you mean by this parabolic statement? What did you mean by this parable? And they would take Jesus by, to the side and ask him, and he would explain to them. Because we know that the mysteries of the kingdom are for his kids. God has secrets and mysteries not hidden from you, but hidden for you. God wants to reveal his truth. He wants to reveal his revelation. So he's revealing it to the disciples. He said, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message of God. I added that part of God. Only to have Satan come out once and take it away. In other words, you're sitting in a service like this. You're hearing the word. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Pastor Damien, that was such a good word. But as soon as you leave this building, Satan is able to steal it because you have a hard heart. And the next one is the seed on the rocky soil represents who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, did you see that? See, you, you can be happy and you can praise God all you want, but if you don't have deep roots, you'll keep coming and you're like, God, Pastor, give me another word. Give me a fresh word. How about you obey the last word you got? That, that's the word of the Lord for you. Obey the last word. You receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represent others who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of life, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good ground, I need you to say this. Declare, I'm good ground, Jesus. 
I tell the Lord, I'm good ground. God, give me a prophetic word. Give me things to obey. Instruct me because I'm going to obey. You know, I, 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 like, I heard this pastor say this. He said that you may be more educated than me. You may have more degrees than me, but you won't out-obey me. And I thought that was pretty powerful because you can have all, and I love degrees, and you can be educated, but if your education doesn't lead to obedience, you're just an intellectual fool because our education into the things of God should be leading us to obedience in God. So I don't care how much education you got. I don't care how much status you got. If none of that is leading you to obeying God, then it is kind of vain. In fact, it's an idol in your life. You let your finances, you let your prestige, you let your reputation, you let your education pride you, lift you up into a lofty place. And the Bible says that you got to humble yourself and you got to submit yourself unto the hand of God. And humility is one of the best things you can do in terms of encountering God. Humility brings spiritual intellect because I got to humble myself because I got to know that sometimes God is not going to package what, what, what my answer is in where I think it will show up. In this season, God has been blessing and answering prayers for Stacy and I in people, in settings, in situations that I would have never known he would have done it in. But if you don't stay curious, if you don't keep an awe of God, if you don't stay humble, you'll think it has to come in your preferences. But God's glory is hidden in our distinctions. And it says, and the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear it, accept it. Another translation says, endures for God's word. And then it says, it produces a harvest of 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Can we give God some praise for that?